Hey everyone, back again. Today I'm going to talk about the Baudrillard Derrida debate that took place in 2003, shortly before uh, Derrida passed away, and a few years before Baudrillard passed away. Now, this debate can be found on YouTube. Just type in Baudrillard Derrida. It's called Pourquoi la guerre? So it's like, why war? Or why war today? But it's only in French. So I'm hoping that what I can give you here for those people that don't speak French is a clear enough summary to give you an idea, a pretty strong idea of what they're arguing about. Now, before jumping into that, if you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can do that on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy or Twitter at David Guineo. If you're new here, welcome. My name is David. I try to explain philosophical texts and ideas so as to make them accessible to you on your philosophical journey, whatever that might look like. If you want to help me out, the best thing, easiest things to do would be to like, share, subscribe. If you want to help me out monetarily, you can do that via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure. And yeah, you know, I don't, I don't want to waste any more of your time. Oh, wait, no, I do. I do want to waste more of your time. If you're watching this, if you found this video on YouTube, you're going to be able to find it in podcast form pretty much anywhere where you get podcasts under the same name where there shouldn't be any ads. Or if you found this in podcast form, you're going to be able to find the video for this on YouTube if you're interested in that at all. Now I don't want to waste any more of your time. Let's jump into this debate. So it took place in February 2003, two years or so after 9-11, right before the United States invaded Iraq. And they are debating here, or they're just kind of discussing what war means at that moment and why it is significant that there's this threat of the U.S. going to war with Iraq, going into Afghanistan as well, what the significance of that is. And this is just to kind of set the, the tone here as to what was going on at that time for anyone that might, you know, I very, may very well have listeners who weren't alive at that time, which is concerning. But anyways, uh, yeah, just to kind of set the groundwork for what that debate was, was all about. So to kind of put it simply, that is to put their two perspectives as simply as I can before getting into the nitty gritty. What Baudrillard is doing here is trying to argue that the event of 9-11, the events of 9-11, demonstrate a symbolic event that can be understood only because it's symbolic, symbolically. And I'm going to unpack what that means as we go through here. But his point is that this can't be understood in traditional political or economic terms. In fact, it would be a violence for him to, to think it can be understood in that way. By contrast, Derrida is in a sense saying that the events of 9-11 are kind of irrelevant to the developments in Iraq that we're soon going to follow after this debate about a month later when, when the United States invaded because there were so many other circumstances, including oil, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, you know, other conflicts of interest that motivated the war in Iraq, and 9-11 was only a little part of it. Now, that's just to kind of set a very basic groundwork for you to help you, you know, know what is going to transpire here and how it's going to play out. So Baudrillard begins by discussing the way in which the symbolic rule is played out and how at the time, so 2003, but he's really talking about the turn of the millennium around the year 2000, at the time, Iraq was under pretty strict surveillance by many different nations, including the United States. There were weapons inspectors around, you know, constant military oversight with aerial surveillance planes and, and other kinds of satellite imagery, stuff like that, that kept a very close eye on Iraq. And what this meant for Baudrillard was that the people of Iraq were placed in a subordinate position to the US or the West more generally, where they were in this sense for Baudrillard given a degree of security and they were put under a kind of totalizing rule that is indicative of the master-slave dialectic out of Hegel, which of course are regrettable terms, but they're what we have to deal with here. where. In the case of the person being rendered subordinate, they do not have access to their own life nor their own death. It is just 
the master that can decide when the slave can live or when they can die. And in that moment, they are suspended. They don't have control over themselves or what can become of them. And for Baudrillard, what that signals is that they lose a kind of attachment to life because they have essentially no, no power. But they're still, they still have to be productive. And so the master has to give them a little bit of life, has to give them a little bit of sustenance, has to give them enough to keep going. But that gift that the master is giving them is purely artificial. It doesn't do anything to actually demonstrate some kind of altruism or benevolence. It is instead a gift given only to maintain the power of the master. Now he thinks that the same can be played out here or can be uh, seen here in the case of the United States or the rest of the quote unquote West really controlling many parts of the Middle East, specifically in this case, Iraq. Now, something ironic happens here, because if we take from this the idea that I think presents itself the most clearly, we'd say, well, okay, uh, the United States and the rest of the West attain their power because they can decide who lives and who, who dies. In fact, they demonstrate a complete mastery over death to the point that they choose who lives and who dies. And Baudrillard would agree, he'd say, yeah, that's absolutely part of it. But something more happens in that instance, in that when they demonstrate such a command over death, and the way that this played out for them in the war was embracing a logic of what they called zero deaths, that actually backfired to some extent in a symbolic way, because now we see the table start to turn where the so-called superpower or superpowers of the world are the ones now that don't have an attachment to death and instead, instead, are beholden to the possibility that death will be imposed upon them. And Baudrillard says that this is what played out on 9-11, where in the case of the terrorists, death was something that they were able to take upon themselves and impose on someone else. So in terms of the master-slave dialectic, they then reversed the situation and became the leaders, the masters in that case. Now, for more on this kind of discussion, a few weeks ago I did an episode just about symbolic exchange, which might be helpful to you if you didn't haven't watched it already, so just go check out my channel or look it up in YouTube or wherever to find it, my discussion on that for more about this uh, symbolic dynamic and what it necessarily means. So this is really what concerns Baudrillard, and it's in that way that he can say that the war itself that would follow 9-11, the Iraq War, whether or not it takes place is really irrelevant. And this is for a few different reasons, really. Firstly, it's irrelevant because it was so statistically mapped out and plotted that there was no real battle ensuing. It was, it was an invasion en masse. It was something that was conducted in order to impose global rule, to demonstrate global rule over a certain population. And it was less of war in that it wasn't two sovereign nations battling it out, as it was an effort to replace the events of 9-11. Because in that moment, during 9-11, in this kind of reversal of global power, even for just a moment, what happened was a supreme embarrassment fell upon the United States and fell upon the quote-unquote West, because it was shown that it could be brought to its knees. Now, that embarrassment happened at such to such an extent that they couldn't actually deal with it. The grieving process was something that they couldn't, they didn't know what to do with it. And that attests to the fact that for, for Baudrillard, 9-11 was an absolute example of an event. It was an event like we've never seen it before. And it's somewhat paradoxical in the way that he describes this because he says that it was an, an event precisely because it wasn't foreseeable. It wasn't something that could be mapped or plotted as the war could be. So it, it was almost like after 9-11, the United States was, was scurrying to try to find something to do in order to distract, to get away from that event as something that is, was haunting them. So the war was just a mode of substitution in that way. It was just a means to substitute 
the anguish produced by 9-11 for something that could be readily understood. And, you know, the, the U.S. Doesn't know, doesn't know anything quite as well as it knows war. It very much knows how to plan it, knows how to execute it, and it knows how to motivate various PR movements around it to sell that war. So by contrast, 9-11 was something that was completely, could not be understood, could not be mapped. And it is for that reason that he calls it an event, uh, a proper event, because it, it was something that fell outside of the purview of the system. That is, it was something that existed outside of this totalizing global schematic and was a kind of novel instance. It was something that, uh, to kind of borrow from Kant, fell outside of the law of cause and effect. It, it couldn't be readily understood in terms of simple causation. And this is also another theme that comes out in Baudrillard's work at other points, but causation gets completely overhauled, gets completely dismantled when we are confronted with a true event. Now he says that the war by contrast, because it was foreseeable, because it was calculable, because it could be understood, was a virtual replacement of that war. So we replaced 9-11 with the war. We replaced Osama bin Laden with Saddam Hussein. In many cases, we see that the war is just a replica of the Gulf War, where you had George Bush, Bush Sr. being replaced by George Bush Jr. What we see here are just a bunch of clones replacing one another so that we can properly make sense of the severity of 9-11, even though it's just an artificial putting a band-aid on the kind of grief that, that was experienced because of 9-11. But the United States' military strategy did not stop at Iraq. It was a way by which to exert its global control across the globe, you know, to really put it into play. And that is because the enemy it was dealing with wasn't really Iraq. That Like, there was no connection between Iraq and Saddam Hussein and um, Osama bin Laden per se, and there were no weapons of mass destruction, you know, the tyranny question was, was certainly questionable. In any case, it was just a way by which to distract from the fact that the terrorism it was really up against was something it couldn't actually fight against because terrorism today, at the time that they were talking about this and still true today, is something that can't be properly plotted out or understood. It happens almost spontaneously. So the only way to actually encourage or to motivate possible preventive measures is to exert even stronger global rules so that you have more satellites in the air, you have more boots on the ground to be able to watch for any so-called suspicious activity or anything like that. And what that encourages is more and more power, more and more domination of the globe. Now for more on this in terms of Baudrillard's work, yeah, um, the text Carnival and Cannibal certainly works on this idea a bit and you get it also as well in the Gulf War did not take place, the spirit of terrorism, fatal strategies, all of, these, all of these texts speak to this issue here of organizing global control in the name of putting an end to the possibility of another event. Because events are disruptive and events are unpredictable and they're very unpleasant. And so this system, because it doesn't like uncertainty, tries to put that uncertainty to death. And it does this through a kind of repression so this global repression seeks to repress, repress for Baudrillard three key things, and those are events, enemies, and death, which are all very, should be pretty clear at this point. It tries to put the event to death because the event is something that disrupts the system. It tries to put enemies to death because it just eradicates them with kind of pre precision drone strikes. There's no like respect in terms of combat or anything like that, and it puts death to death because it tries to embrace a logic of zero deaths. And he has this one kind of quip in, I believe it was the Gulf War, and the Gulf War did not take place, where he says that like, well, if all of those American troops had stayed home, it is statistically more likely that more of them would have died in car crashes in the States than died in, uh, in, a, in Iraq at that time. So that for him signals the fact that this is hardly a war, like there's hardly anything that resembles a war here, yet we still sell it as such because we have to give a face to the enemy that apparently attacked us. Now here we get into Jacques Derrida's first point. And his point is he wants to focus on 
a mutation. Specifically, he is concerned with the mutation of international law. And he's going to talk about, and I'm going to be quite frank about this, he's kind of all over the place. And I'm going to do my best to really articulate his words in a way that are clear and, and concise and that stay on point. But he, he talks a lot and brings up a lot of things. So let's, let's go through it kind of point by point. Now, he really begins by considering the global protests that were occurring at the time, that is just before and, and following the United States' invasion of Iraq. And he says that this is, you know, obviously this is great. People were uh, up in arms about this uh, impending invasion, this impending quote-unquote war. And he takes that to be quite a good sign. But in that, he recognizes that no matter how big these protests get, no matter how loud the voices of the people are, even in democratic countries, it will never be loud enough to actually disrupt national power or national decision making. Because a protest is not a vote. A protest is not a vote either on the national stage or at the United Nations. It is just a kind of purely symbolic gesture, not symbolic, not in the Baudrillardian sense, but just a symbolic gesture that doesn't do much uh, on the world stage per se. So while he is a little bit cautious about praising these protests, he uses them to talk about something else, to say that between the Gulf War and between this impending war, we see a very big difference in terms of not only the people's response to it, but the way that the war is going to be prepared for and conducted in relation to international law, in relation to the United Nations. And so in contrast to Baudrillard, he's not saying that uh, the war following 9-11 is in any way a mirror of or a substitution for or a simulation of the Gulf War. And he gives a number of reasons. He's like, you can't, we can't deny the deaths that have occurred and, and just say that they're just, it's just a simulation of, of the Gulf War. It's just a virtual form of the Gulf War. Like we absolutely can't say that because of all the deaths that are occurring because of other various interests that are diametrically different or opposed to the interests that motivated, that encouraged the events of the Gulf War. Because in the case of the Gulf War, Iraq had violated the sovereign autonomy of Kuwait by invading them, which essentially encouraged the war. Now, in this case, Iraq has done nothing. That is not, no kind of demonstration of force in any way like that. In fact, they've been quite, they've been quite peaceful in almost every way. They've been very uh, submissive to all of the requests for like weapons reports, for uh, you know, the reduction of military conflict, everything like that. And so Derrida is like, well, it doesn't really make sense to say that 9-11 is a determining factor for that war that was going to be ensuing because Iraq didn't have anything to do with it. So we can't just say that 9-11 was the determining factor for that war. Now, additionally, whereas before the Gulf War, there was no war, before this war, as I kind of already suggested, there has been war to some extent, there's been repeated violations of Iraq's sovereign autonomy with these military inspections, with these weapons inspections, with constant surveillance of Iraq's military, with Iraq's, of Iraq's populations, something that no other nation on earth would allow for. Imagine if the table had been turned and Iraqi planes were flying over the United States, like they would be absolutely up in arms about that. They would not allow that in any way. Yet. There was an expectation that Iraq's sovereignty was a lesser sovereignty than, let's say, France or the United States or Germany or whatever. Now, this discussion of sovereignty obviously played itself out on the world stage at the United Nations. So there was this recognition that Iraq had very little not only to do with 9-11, if anything at all, but there was there's impositions upon them. Yet, yet the war was approved by the United Nations and various other uh, resolutions were passed to condemn not only Iraq, but to condemn uh, international terrorism. And if anything, and, and Derrida is very clear, he's not like advocating this. He's like, if anything, if any country were to have been invaded, it would have been Pakistan for their wielding nuclear weapons, for their connection to Al Qaeda. Yet, that's not what happened. 
So instead, he's like, well, we you can't just focus on 9-11. We have to look at all the other factors that encouraged this attack on Iraq because there were other factors that must have come into play because if we only focused on 9-11, then our real interest would have been with Pakistan. And so those things that we can't forget are oil and death, pretty much. Two things that he says can't be virtualized, can't be rendered virtual, things that really point to why Iraq was chosen, was targeted in all of this and not any other country. And this also explains then why countries like France, Germany, other parts of the United Nations had approved this war, even though there was no good reason for it, because they too have vested interests in that part of the world, in Iraq's oil reserves that would be uh, sealed, at least these possible oil futures would be guaranteed with the United States' involvement there. And now he considers the question of autoimmunity, which is obviously a very difficult issue, and it's one that I'm not going to be able to unpack in its entirety here. But he talks about autoimmunity not only in terms of the way that terrorism plays itself out, like with people committing suicide in order to promote life in some cases while taking it away in others, but he says that the United States operates at an autoimmune level in that they are supposedly fighting in the name of democracy while also limiting threatening that very democracy, not only on other people's soil by dropping bombs on everyone, but also on their own, you know, with cases like Guantanamo Bay or with perse prosecuting uh, people who oppose the war or with Abu Ghraib. Like you have all these examples of the United States attacking the very democracy they're claiming to defend in a kind of autoimmune fashion. The potency of their attack on you know democracy itself on Iraq was proportionate to the amount of anxiety that they experienced following 9-11 because they didn't know who was really attacking them and they didn't know how bad the next attack would be and Derrida says well I guarantee that if the United States had absolute assurance that this wasn't going to happen again then they probably wouldn't have waged this war. But the fact that they didn't know when it was going to happen again, which is part of the name for part of the game for terrorism, because it doesn't follow a plan or a map or is properly laid out, that encourages so much more insecurity, which then manifests itself in the form of retaliation. And this signals as well for him a mutation in terms of terrorism itself, because historically terrorism, and he thinks back to the French Revolution where the term comes from, from the reign of terror in English or uh, la terreur in, in French, where terrorism was conducted in the name of the state. It was, it was a way to encourage liberty, freedom for people within a state for, and for the state itself to embrace those values. Whereas the terrorism they're discussing at this point something that is stateless, it doesn't belong anywhere, it's just a free-floating thing, kind of mirroring the logic of capitalism, even though that's not what he says, and it, and it just can spring up anywhere. Now to respond to this, Baudrillard says that he's in agreement that terrorism is not ideological, it doesn't, it doesn't correspond to a strict ideology, it is instead for him a strategy. It is a response, it's a kind of ab reaction to a bigger issue, and that bigger issue is total global control by the West. That is maintaining and organizing power in such a way as to maintain control over everyone. There is a desire to maintain a very strong surveillance mechanism over them because there's always that possibility that a little event might occur that might disrupt the whole thing. Now, Baudrillard uses this point to say that, well, in the case of a unification against terrorism by all these superpowers, what actually occurs is an undermining of that very power, which might seem totally counterintuitive, and in a sense it is, because it's Baudrillard and he tries to make as little sense as possible at times. But what he's saying is that when all these countries got on the same side to fight so-called international terrorism, what they did was actually signed away the possibility for sovereignty, for nationhood, for anything like that. And what we begin to see is a kind of dissipation of differences and a kind of melting pot of different cultures and beliefs under the umbrella of total control that is kind of 
steered at at the helm by the United States. And so there is an organizing effort, a kind of coherence of values around that gravitates towards almost this very homogenous idea about global control. And with that, we see the end of sovereignty. We see the end of representation. We see the end of difference in favor of this kind of totalizing viral control. And what is the result? Well, terrorists are kind of selected as a sort of scapegoat in all this, but what happens is everyone is seen as a possible enemy. All people are seen as an enemy to this system. And people have really little power at the end of the day. There's very little that any protest is going to do against a nation that wields nuclear weapons, yet we still engage in these symbolic gestures, thank God. Uh, they haven't been completely eradicated yet, but there's very little that can be done. And with that, we all become, for Baudrillard, victims to this, this system, this kind of totalizing global order. And he gives the example of a case in Moscow where the uh, che Chechens, Chechens um, had taken, I think it was 120 or so hostages in, in Moscow, in a theater in Moscow. And the Russian special forces went in and put this like poisonous gas into the air vents and it killed everyone. It killed the terrorists and the hostages. And Baudrillard uses this point to say that, well, this is what's going to happen if we continue to allow, if we continue to allow this power to foment and to grow to such a point that they are just going to be able to exert their power in such a way as to eradicate people for, for no good reason other than just wanting to. And so Baudrillard, unlike Derrida, claims to not have so many illusions about the future of international law, the future of the possibility of the right to veto at the United Nations to oppose a war, the fact that the United States needed uh, approval. And he says that he has less illusions about the possibility for protest that is going to lead to this wonderful alternative because it very well didn't, as in the case of the Iraq war. It still ensued. There were still hundreds of thousands of dead Iraqis for no good reason. Not that there ever could be a good reason for something like that. But these people were killed in the name of nothing. And it is the demonstration not of an ideological battle, a battle for control of the world just for the sake of that. And ironically, and this is the big twist for Baudrillard, in this way, bin Laden won because bin Laden was able to bring this world into such turmoil, into such chaotic order, which is just my term, but it's a way to say that with this ordering comes the possibility of something's demise where if you get too strong, you will fail type thing. And we are seeing that happen and we're seeing the possibility of this collapse growing ever more present. And, and it, it is inevitable. And for Baudrillard, I think he would trace it back to 9-11 as being uh, a singular event that encouraged this globalized totalitarian rule. Now, Derrida chimes in once more, and don't worry, we're getting, we're getting to the end here. Derrida chimes in again to say that, well, he doesn't want it to seem as though he's harboring these naive illusions about the possibilities of protests. He still wants to highlight the fact that the United States didn't just go to war. They needed approval, which is a good thing. Like they needed other countries to be on board with it. And the fact that they were is totally absurd because of course there's no good reason for it. And it just demonstrates that they, uh, they had interest there. Now he responds by asking, what is it exactly that the United States has given these people that what is it exactly that the so-called West has given these people in order to warrant this kind of master-slave dynamic that uh, Baudrillard is writing about, talking about. And he says that, you know, these people live absolutely impoverished lives. They're sitting on these oil reserves, yet they make no money from it. They make nothing from it. They, they live alienated, exploited lives that are not very prosperous. They haven't been receiving gifts in any way, shape, or form. And before Baudrillard has the time to respond to that, and he will, he will in a moment, Derrida continues on by putting forward the point that, uh, recalling a time that he was in the United States, I believe at the time he was in the United States, and he was watching various debates ensuing about some new resolution at the United Nations in which someone named Kofi Annan, Annan maybe, um, I believe that's how you pronounce it, 
Kofi Annan had s- said, had admitted that they were discussing this thing called international terrorism without having a really strong grasp of what that actually was. Because when it comes down to it, if you throw out some possible definitions, you will soon come to find that the United States hits many of these criteria. Uh, they are absolutely a sponsor of state terrorism and they are uh, a kind of proponent of it, it themselves. They are a kind of uh, a limb of that very that very logic themselves. And so Derrida uses that point to essentially say that, well, we need to still take a step back here to question what terrorism even is and that ultimately, for him, 9-11 didn't mean that much. 9-11 was something that was just consequential of other events that were going to lead to the Iraq war anyways. Now, Baudrillard responds to that question, that is, what has the West given these people, by saying that, well, in the case of the master-slave dialectic, the, the slave hasn't received anything either. They receive exploitation. They receive horrible lives. And it is in that demonstration of the capacity to give life, even if it is a horrible life, that is itself still the demonstration of a capacity to give life and to determine when death can ensue. Taking that capacity from the person that is being exploited, being manipulated. Now, Baudrillard says as well that he finds it kind of troubling that Derrida is minimizing the the impact of 9-11 by saying that it was just you know, just some inconsequential event that uh, the the outcome would have been the same either way, which might be true, but the way in which that outcome might have played out would have been very different had 9-11 not been there to motivate it. And Derrida gets the final word in to say that, well, he still thinks it would have been the same thing anyways. Whether or not there was 9-11, the same war would have taken place. And that's more or less it. Uh, I hope it was helpful what I was able to offer here for those that don't have access to the debate or don't know uh, French enough to be able to listen to it. Um, But yeah, if anyone has listened to this and there's anything that you know from it that I should have mentioned or think that's important to mention, let me know, you know, tell the world in the comments. Uh, And if, you know, you're listening to this in podcast form on Apple Podcasts, leave five stars, uh, reviews, I loved reading them. And yeah, Click on one of these sides for a new video and I'll catch you next time. Take care.